as we launch our voters panel in this general election year. We've teamed up with YouGov and we're going to spend the next two weeks getting under the skin of people who voted Conservative in 2019. And there's bad news for both Rishi Sunak and Keir Starmer. Get on and pay people. Mr Bates versus the post office reenacted in front of MPs as the parliamentary inquiry into the Horizon IT scandal descends into rows and recrimination. As the Prime Minister faces accusations of Islamophobia in his party, one of America's leading civil rights voices tells us that racism is being used as a political weapon in the UK. Sacked for doing my job, the claim of the former Chief Inspector of Immigration, David Neal, removed from his post last week. Plus... You will not mention that name in front of me, that filthy piece of toe rag. <laughs> We look at where members of the public might have stumbled onto the nation's zeitgeist. All that and more with Ed Vasey and Josh Simons, who will be with us for the next hour. It's Tuesday, I'm Sophie Ridge, live from Westminster, and this is The Politics Hub. Hello, good evening. Now, we often talk about polls on this programme. Who's up, who's down? And look, don't get me wrong, polls are a really useful political tool. They can tell us what people are thinking, but they can't tell us why they think it or how strongly they feel it. Because, frankly, politics isn't always a clinical thing. It's an emotional thing too, something that you feel in your gut. And here on The Politics Hub in this crucial election year, we want to really get a sense of what people are both thinking and feeling. And we know that's not always something you can do from a studio in Westminster. So tonight we are launching the Voters Panel, a UK first with pollsters YouGov, a group of more than 30 people who voted Conservative in 2019, who we're going to be keeping in touch with over the next two weeks and getting real-time reaction from. Now, some of these people describe themselves as swing voters, Others say they back the Conservatives all of their lives. And it's this second group that campaign bosses at Conservative Party headquarters believe is key to the next general election. You know, I've spoken to people close to the Conservative campaign who say that group is the reason they feel there may still be some hope when it comes to the next election. But what we found tonight suggests that Rishi Sunak is failing to hold together the voting coalition that delivered Boris Johnson his victory in 2019 and, crucially, They've been explaining why. So, to explain all, here's a man who's been looking into all this, our Deputy Political Editor, Sam Coates. End the boasting, the excuses, the Tory chaos, and call a general election now. The countdown to an election. Westminster endlessly trading blows, hoping that you are watching. He's not a leader, he is a human weather vane. Yeah! But are the lines that politicians repeat ones that really matter to you? This is Rishi's recession. They don't have a plan. Uh, this is a time when we need to stick to our guns. Because just months from an election, it's what the voters make of all of this that really matters. So we're asking them how they'll vote and why. Starting a new online community to show us the thinking behind the polls. We're desperate to find out what you think about the politicians and issues. Be honest about what you want to hear from our political leaders. We can't wait to hear it. They're not holding back. British politics is, is a shambles at the moment. We've lost a lot of confidence in the leaders of our country. I think it's broken, quite honestly. The Tories have made a complete mess of everything. All the money is in the wrong place. It's at the top. I have no faith in politics, politicians. Um, I don't believe anything that they say. Today, we launch this, the voters' panel. Dozens of 2019 Conservative voters, the people who will decide the next election. They're going to be telling us directly what they think over this week and next, a UK first, with the polls to YouGov. Now, it's an online community from across the country. More than 30 different seats representing England, Scotland and Wales. All of the people that you see here voted Conservative in 2019. So much of what's happening at Westminster is a fight over these voters. Where will they go? Well, let's see. Now, of the 33, only nine say that they're likely to vote Conservative at the next election. Now, that would be a devastating blow to the Conservatives' chances of forming the next government. And 
it's reflective of the national picture that we see in polling as well. The latest YouGov polling shows that only a third of Tory voters last time are going to stick with them. And look at that, a fifth going to reform. But the voters panel allows us to explore why. It feels like we need a, a seismic shift uh, in politics in this country. Um, and I'm, personally, I'm just tired of all the, the mediocrity. They have promised so much about stopping immigration and protecting the NHS. And I just don't feel that they've done enough. No redeeming features about them at all. Absolutely nothing, sadly. So there's very little I can see in any situation that could push me to vote Conservative. Now, it's not much kinder when we ask what words they associated with Rishi Sunak. Yes, articulate and intelligent, but look, weak, rich and untrustworthy are all amongst the most common terms used. Now, what about Keir Starmer? I just don't get him. Uh, he comes across as being awkward, mealy-mouthed. He doesn't connect. I think he's much better than Corbyn used to be. He's, like, more professional and not short-sighted. I wouldn't really say he's a prime minister in waiting. I would just sort of say he's just there waiting for something. But you've got to look hard for good news here. Aspiration and suitable, yes, but that's dwarfed by indecisive, uninspiring and unbelievable. But these voters, the people who made Boris Johnson Prime Minister in 2019, don't need to love Keir Starmer for him to win the election. I am quite worried about the state of the country at the moment. Um... Every voter, every view matters more in an election year, telling us about who they want to punish more than who they want in power. Almost all these voters angry about the state of the nation. If Rishi Sunak loses them, he loses the keys to number 10. Will they give his party another chance? We're going to find out. Sam Coates, Sky News. Well, Sam joins us now. Sam, I am fascinated by this stuff. And it's not just me. We know, don't we, that all the political parties, they do their own focus groups, voters' panels, because they, they look at the numbers in the polls, but they want to get under the skin of what people feel and learn a bit more too. And I just wonder, what do you think you really learned from this exercise? You really do have to go much deeper than just opinion polls with their numbers allow you to do to understand the motivations of the electorate. And I've already learned so much. I mean, one of the big things that comes through is just the negativity of the electorate. And politicians talk about it, but we, you'll see it. You have seen it through the focus group. When you listen to them, the panel don't talk about this as a, as a, a fight between two potential prime ministers. They're looking much more about who they want to punish. And I think that's a fascinating kind of turn of the conversation. And that doesn't work very well for the Conservatives, but the, the polls bear that out. But the anger is directed at the Tory chaos and at the state of, of, of public services. But that leads us on to another really big and important lesson that I'm starting to hear from our panel, which is they're worried about the state of public services. They're, of course, concerned about the cost of living. But when they weigh those two things up, I did hear quite a lot about the need to spend more on public services. I didn't, and we say this a week before a budget, learn that much from people who were demanding tax cuts. Let's see some more. The NHS, um, there's long waiting lists. Um, they're underfunded yet again. Um, the government needs to put more money into the NHS to reduce waiting lists. Um, the economy, I mean, it's... It's failing. Um, they're going to need to put a lot of investment. Government doesn't seem willing um, to back down to the doctors to give them a decent pay rise. We don't know when the election's going to be, but we're already in campaign mode, it feels. And I guess both parties are going to feel like they need to cut through, the, particularly with Conservatives. Can they make a change? Um, and I just wonder, you know, you were reporting uh, yesterday on ad spending shooting up. Do you feel like we're seeing any sign that, that any of that campaigning is working? That is the question, Sophie. I've 
we've both done this quite a long time and, and the moment you start to Watch hear those... those <laughs> <laughs> but we have. And the moment you start to hear slogans being re reported back to you on the doorstep that politicians use, you, you know something's starting to gel. And while a lot of the conversation doesn't reflect those slogans yet, you know, you get vague themes about Rishi Sunak being weak or Keir Starmer being a flip-flopper. I was only getting the first little kind of flicks of people actually adopting the things that politicians are telling them right now. Watch these two. My worry is now, though, because of um, how things are going, you know, at the moment that the Labour Party will get in and we will be back to square one. And, um, yeah, taking things again from that. I will probably vote for Labour. Um, and put Keir in charge. He's had a rough background in the past. Uh, hard, so he knows what it's like. Back to square one. We've heard yeah. that so often, haven't we, from Conservative politicians. And Keir Starmer tried to hammer home what his dad did, mm. uh, coming from a working-class, difficult background. My question is, who's first? Is it the politician or is it the focus group? Are they nicking these phrases because they hear them in focus groups or are they coming up with them and then people are repeating them? Every single big campaign slogan in the last year, few years, I think, Sophie, has come from focus groups. First, so get Brexit done, uh, take back control, long-term economic plan. You'll notice that there were, you know, one Brexit campaign, two Tory slogans. Tory's quite good at the way that they use focus group groups. And, and, the, and I don't think the Tories or Labour have quite found their linguistic formulations yet in this campaign. That's one of the reasons why we didn't get that much repetition of, 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 of slogans. But one thing that I found extraordinary was in this focus group, which is the party with the clearest message that I'm hearing back from the voters is reform. Mm. Not a big party, to the right of the Conservatives, but these voters know a lot about this party that hasn't fought a general election before. They know that it's clear on immigration, they know where it stands on tax and spend, and they know that that's where you go to punish the Tories if you're a true blue Conservative but don't think they've done and lived up to expectations and the hopes you had of 2019. So for all of the focus groups that the big parties rely on, mm. reform, and there were voters in this panel who voted Tory in 2019, plumping for reform, they're doing something right. Uh, fascinating uh, to hear. Thank you so much, uh, Sam Coates. We're going to have lots more analysis uh, of what uh, Sam has been looking into on the programme tonight. But I just want to bring you an update because we've got a bit of breaking news now because MPs have allowed the suspension of Blackpool South MP Scott Benton to go through on the Nord. So no vote required. And that means a recall, recall petition is triggered. And it does raise the prospect of another potential by-election in Blackpool South, which is a really marginal seat. Now, Mr Benton was elected as a Conservative in 2019 with a 3,690 majority. I don't need to tell you that that is not very much in these times, uh, but he currently sits as an independent. He was found to have breached Commons rules after he was caught by the Times offering to lobby ministers and table parliamentary questions on behalf of gambling investors. Well, let's return now to our voters panel, uh, shall we? Lots to digest from what we've uh, been hearing. Uh, a little earlier, I spoke to the Shadow Business Secretary, Jonathan Reynolds. Thank you very much for being on the programme this evening. So, firstly, I want to talk about our voters yeah. panel. And I think it is important to reflect that actually, you know, the headline news is that it's overwhelmingly bad for the Conservatives. People who voted in Conservative in 2019 switching to other parties or staying at home. Is, is that what you're picking up on the doorstep? Oh, yeah, it is. I mean, the last few days I've been not just in my own constituency, I've been in Blackpool, where we're expecting a by-election. I've been to New Mills and High Peak, traditional, very marginal constituency. And absolutely, there is a sense and a very clear conviction that the Conservative Party has failed, that uh, it's not one or... Two decisions recently, it's the 14-year record that people are quite rightly unhappy with. And, of course, they're looking for an alternative. And I believe, because of what Labour has done, we can be the alternative people didn't see us as in 2019. Always more to do, of course. But, of course, we can say to those people, the country needs change. And the change that we can deliver, we can prove to you we can deliver, because look at how Labour itself has changed. And I think that is important. I think that's it, isn't it? People are looking for an alternative. Because what the panel also shows, you know, digging it a little deeper, around... A fifth of Conservative voters said they'd switch to Labour. 
But the rest of them, you know, they're switching to the Lib Dems, to reform, they don't know who to vote for, they want to stay at home. Is that enough? To well, switch direct switches to Labour? We've seen in the by-elections direct switching, and obviously we want more of that. Our job is to, is to tell those people you can trust us, come along and tell us what you need from us. But we think what we're putting forward is a real plan, is a real alternative. I, I've been at the big Make UK conference today, manufacturers conference, setting out Labour's plan ahead of the budget, which of course is for industrial strategy, for our green prosperity plan, for fixing the Brexit relationship, sorting out the planning system, getting Britain building. We've got a really solid Program And, of course, as you get closer to an election, you get a bit more chance as the opposition to put that forward, and that's what we're going to do. But, of course, I'm going to say, compared to where we were in 2019, where, to be honest, it was people switching away from Labour and Labour voters saying they couldn't this time support Labour, I'll accept people switching to us. You see, this is the thing, isn't it? Is the kind of slightly depressing truth about this election? You don't really need that many people directly switching to you. You just need them to not vote Conservative, and that will get you over the line. So are we basically in for you know, an anti-Tory campaign rather than a positive Labour campaign? No, I think, look, the fact that the government's record is so poor will affect how traditional Conservative voters see it. And some of those people who voted Conservative maybe in every election in their lifetimes who are saying this time, no, I mean, that, that is, you know, it's a response to the scale of the government's failure. But we're going to be out making the positive case. And, of course, we wouldn't have won the kind of by-elections. I mean, let's be honest, the by-elections we've won, yeah. not even in target seats for Labour. And the scale of what Labour needs to do, so we're trying to double the parliamentary Labour party. You say you've got to go out and make the positive case, because it, it feels like, just going back to, you know, what people are telling us in these um, voter panels, that they're not sure exactly what that positive case is. Emma, Keir Starmer, someone that sits on the fence quite a lot. Tom, is he a capable leader? I don't know. We'll find out. He's also described as indecisive. When are you going to make this positive case and tell us exactly what the Labour vision well, is? I mean, it's not going badly so far, let's be clear. Look at the poor lead, look at the, the by-election results. My point there is, are I'm not arguing votes. with that, but my point is that's people switching away from Conservatives rather than necessarily switching deliberately well, to Labour. The by-elections, to win on those scale, in those places, saw so significant switching to Labour. Of course, we want more than that. But look, I mean, in 2019, after that election, when we were having the, the leadership election in Labour, the question was people saying, look, you're going to have to try and pick a leader who sorts the Labour Party out. You never, you've got no chance of winning the next election. The fact we're competitive speaks to the scale of the job that Keir has done. And I think very few people could deliver on the scale that Keir has done that on. And I think if you look into Labour's policy programme, there's actually more detail there than, you know, most oppositions have had at this scale. I think what we genuinely need to do, and we, we would all reflect on this in the Shadow Cabinet, is tell it a bit more in the human story. You know, this thing we had about how much should we spend on the Green Prosperity Plan, really, what we need to do is say, look, it means green steel in your communities, it means warm homes, it means, you know, gigafactories so our car industry continues to be the, the success it can be. That's how we need to get it across. A bit more of that from Labour, we would reflect on that, absolutely. But look, we've got a great programme there, a real plan, and I think it is in real contrast to where the government have got to. OK, you're talking there about you know, telling human stories, setting out exactly what, what it means for people. Um, let's look ahead to the budget, uh, mm. shall we, and try and get a bit more of a sense about where Labour's at. The IFS has warned the Chancellor against cutting taxes in the budget. The IFS are saying now is not the time for tax cuts. Do you agree? I think the public finances are a mess. and The departmental spending limits the Chancellor sets out, they're already, to be honest, a bit of a fantasy in terms of whether they could ever deliver on that. But, look, we've been making a case, Rachel Reeves has been making a case for some years now, unless the economy grows more strongly, any decision on public services, funding them, tax cuts... Look, you're not going to be able to deliver anything what you want unless the economy grows more strongly. I and really, I feel I really don't know what your answer to the question is. It is now the time for tax cuts? Well, look, I, I struggle to see, on this level of growth and on these public spending forecasts, how that could be done. I'm afraid I don't have faith in the Chancellor to make rational decisions. I, I don't think the chance, of, the chance of doing the right thing, if it's not, you know, around the electoral interests of the Conservative Party, I don't know what he might put forward, to be honest. And there's been so much speculation, one side or the other, it's hard to say. But what this country needs, what the priority has got to be, is a focus on growth. So just to unpick that slightly, you're saying there that you don't see how tax cuts can be done right now. So are you effectively saying you agree with the IFS, now is not the time for tax cuts, we can't afford them? Look, I respect the IFS's analysis. I'm afraid what I'm saying is I... I wouldn't put it past the Chancellor to ignore the experts. I don't care about what the Chancellor's... I mean, I obviously do care about what the Chancellor's going to do, but right now, I, I want to know what you would do. You know, you want to be in government yeah, this year. Absolutely, I'm not right. talking about five, So if it was years. a Labour budget, that's a far easier question. We saw out the planning system. We get Britain building houses... Would you cut taxes? And infrastructure. That's the question. Again, I, I think... Or is we, now not the time? We have 
for instance, policies already to cut things like business rates and to reorganise how that system works. We wouldn't, for instance, be cutting corporation tax. We've said we're going to keep that at the level. It's at capita at that level. We'd only change it if other countries change it. But the focus from us would be on industrial strategy, sorting out the apprenticeship levy, sorting out the um, planning system, making sure we fix the, the Brexit uh, arrangements, all practical things to make the economy grow more strongly. And, and the, until the economy grows more strongly, no sustainable spending or tax cuts will be possible. Yeah, Emma says Keir Starmer is someone that sits on the fence quite a lot. I just don't know what the answer to the question is. Well, because... I'm not asking, like, would you take a penny off income tax? Or I'm not asking for but, to write but these, the manifesto. These, these are hypothetical but I do, No, I think questions. it's not a hypothetical question. I think that there is a genuine debate right now about taxes. The IFS says we can't afford to do them now. they got to wait. Other people saying, look, the tax burden is really, really high. We need to try and ease the burden on people's pockets. Where do you sit? I say you ease the burden by growing the economy. That's got to be the only way. So no that tax you cuts. No, that's, that's I, not your, I, that's I not don't why you're, believe you're the at. public finance are in a strong position. But I obviously know. Let's be honest. We know the Chancellor will mess about. He'll try and set some sort of trap up. He'll present the economy as performing in a different way. And Chancellors have a lot of power. Look, they can set the narrative. They can say they've got fiscal headroom by pretending they're going to do things we know they're not going to do. Field duty every year. So you've got to be canny in opposition. And we're going to be canny because we know this country needs an alternative. We know the, the power of the Tory machine to, to parrot false narratives. We are going to put forward our plan which is strong which is robust which people can see and it's in a huge contrast to the weakness of the prime minister and the record of the last 14 years the other big story in westminster today has been the post office with the select committee yeah. uh, looking into uh, what exactly is going on in the post office and to be honest you know i always struggle to write an interview question on it because i was like you know there's, there's so much going on there's a he said she said the overwhelming impression is just of a complete shambles. Yeah, I absolutely agree with that. I think if you were a sub postmaster watching that today, you would not have been impressed. And uh, as you say, the allegation, the counter allegation, this wasn't good at all. I, I think the only way you'll cut through that cynicism is get on with the exonerations that the Prime Minister promised six weeks ago now. No sign of the legislation quite yet. Maybe make an announcement too quickly on that for the, for the headlines rather than doing the detail, but if you, if you get the exonerations right, that's how the compensation is unlocked. The two things are automatically connected to each other. That's why we've been working with the government on the right way to do that, but it, it, we've got to get on with it. But today, I didn't look good. Alan Bates, the kind of hero of the hour, if you like, the man who's driven all this from the start, yeah. he says that the post office should just be sold off to Amazon for a pound. What do you make of that? Well, Alan has seen the failures of the post office, and I think we all understand that. I, I wouldn't think that is the right way to go about this, and the post office is still... Fundamentally important British institution. I think where you haven't got a post office as an MP, you're campaigning to get one because of the role it plays in the community. Clearly how it's been run, how people have been treated, not acceptable in, in any way. But, you know, there is a job that someone could come in uh, and do when it comes to the post office. Look at the, you know, the, the failure of uh, banking services on the high streets, how the post office and banking hubs are having to fill that gap. There's still a need for that, and it's still right to have that in the public sector as it is. And if that is sorted out, there could be a strong future. OK, thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Well, let's bring in our duo for tonight, shall we? The former Conservative Culture Minister, Lord Ed Vasey, and Josh Simons, the Director of Labour Together. Great to have you both on the programme uh, tonight. Josh, I feel like I should go to you first, because this, you know, focus groups, voters panels, this is the kind of stuff you do all the time. Um, are you finding the same things that we saw earlier in the programme? Yeah, we are. And uh, actually, we're, we're doing a big project, project at the moment, looking into the Conservative 2019 Voter Coalition. And one of the interesting things that we're finding is exactly what Sam mentioned at the end there, which is the most important issue, the, the, the thing that defines those who voted Conservative in 2019 and unites them in a sense, is that immigration for them is a more important issue than any other issue, even the cost of living. Mm. So the, for, for the majority of voters as a whole, it's the cost of living and their household finances that is the most important issue. But for those Conservative 2019 voters that you're looking at and we're looking at, um, actually, it's immigration that is the most important issue. Mm -hmm. And the most surprising thing of all about that is for the first time in decades, Labour are ahead on migration, and they've for a long time been behind. Mm -hmm. And about 85% of voters that we've looked at and YouGov has looked at think that the Conservatives are doing a bad job on migration. And that's the sort of central conundrum in a way that they face. That's why they're arguing and infighting about Rwanda, because their voters in their coalition care most about migration, but 85% of them think that they're doing a bad job on migration. It's really interesting. And Sam also saying that a lot of the reform messages are cutting through. People know what they stand for. Um, 
Yeah, you learn a lot from... I, I find it really interesting, I have to say. Um, the other point Sam was making was that it's quite a negative election. People are voting against someone because they don't like someone, not necessarily because they love a manifesto or a policy idea that someone's putting forward. Is that what you're all kind of picking up, you think? Well, there was the lady who uh, was interviewed in Sam's piece who said, Keir Starmer's not a prime minister in waiting, he's just there, waiting, which uh, I thought was a, a very a great line, actually. Mm -hmm. Uh, and so there is definitely, um, you know, there, there is that old cliche that governments lose elections, oppositions don't win them. This will be an election, I think, where this is completely defined as happening because uh, you could argue that Margaret Thatcher won her election or you could argue that Tony Blair won his election. But it does seem that Keir Starmer hasn't sealed the deal with the electorate, but they will do potentially anything to get the Tories out. I'm not saying the election's a foregone conclusion, but that's the kind of mood that we're in. And it's fascinating to hear what you were saying, Josh, about all uh, the salience of issues with yeah. voters and, indeed, what came out in Sam's piece. I mean, this great unanswered question about reform, mm. what votes will it get at the general election, will it impact on Tory uh, seats? Mm. Uh, this great question about immigration, I was going to ask you, has Rishi Sunak inadvertently made it a more salient issue mm. by making it one of his five pledges? If he just shut up about it or just said we're going to not stop the boats but we're going to have a big impact on it, would that have made a difference? Or are voters looking at the very high numbers of, of legal immigration, the almost a million, I think, that have come in in the last year or so, I just say that as a neutral point, mm. uh, is that something that they're looking at that's pushed immigration to the forefront? But all of this is going to be fascinating to see what voters are thinking mm. as the election approaches. Uh, but as I say, I do, it's not a criticism necessarily, Keir Starmer, but it does feel like he, if he does win the election, he'll win it because people do not want a Tory government. Um, you're obviously close to you know, Team Starmer. Uh, is that a problem, that people feel he's just there waiting? If he wins by default, wins a win. <laughs> Well, I think that we're quite early doors. I mean, I know we in this, you know, sort of Westminster world are getting Feels very like it's been excited. Going on for five years. I know, <laughs> but you know, well, I was actually the other day reading um, newspaper headlines from 1996 because that's how much of a nerd mm. I am. And <laughs> really, was, uh... it was pretty nerdy, but yeah. Yeah, it was actually fascinating because you know the Times headline was um, "Voters gone off Tories but not turned on to Labour," oh, and right. they were saying this. That you is know, interesting. In retrospect, uh, we grant you that. We tell this story <laughs> that uh, you know, you're so surprised. That, uh, <laughs> but seriously, you know. They, Someone sent me about four of these headlines and they said, oh, you know, we, we tell this story that Tony Blair and Thatcher, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, the whole country was mobilised behind yeah. them. And I think, actually, you know, we're still potentially eight, nine months away from an election. Most voters have got things like paying their bills, you yeah, know, yeah, their wage. They're really busy. Their household finances are stressed. You know, they're looking after young kids. We've all been there. And they are not really thinking about what Labour's manifesto is going to be or the detail of its green prosperity plan. So I think the question for the Labour Party is, when voters do turn on and think, actually, you know, who do I want to run this country given the state that it's in? That is the moment at which the sort of leadership and clarity and ruthlessness that Keir Starmer has applied to the Labour Party, I think voters have to think, yeah, you know what? I'd back him to do that for our country too. Uh, really interesting. Uh, thank you both uh, very much. Uh, fascinating chat. We'll have uh, much more from our panel on the programme later. Now, you're watching The Politics Hub. Coming up... Just get on and pay people. That was the message from the former sub-postmaster and lead campaigner, Mr Bates, to MPs today, as the delays to payouts in the post office scandal grind on. We'll have more on that next. Trust in politics is at an all-time low. What's going wrong and can we fix it? I'll be hosting a new weekly podcast with two powerhouses of British politics, Labour MP Jess Phillips and Conservative peer Ruth Davidson. We'll work out who's on top and who's having an electoral dysfunction. <laughs> Available every Friday wherever you get your podcasts.
There is a, a lot of gas being fired all around us. It is an absolute carnival kind of atmosphere out here for Prime Minister Modi's decisive increase. These students are defying the privately orders and now they're going to be arrested. We aim to be the best and most trusted place for news. The roads have been inundated. The only way out is to get people by boat. What is feared that over 200 people might have died because of these landslides. This on any given day would have been bustling with people, but today it's absolutely deserted. This is one of the most sensitive areas of, uh, of Northeast Delhi where there's been clashes. I'm Neville Lazarus and I'm Sky's reporter based in Delhi. Welcome back. You're watching the Politics Hub. Just get on and pay people. The former sub-postmaster Alan Bates told MPs today. Mr Bates, who has of course spearheaded the campaign seeking justice for those caught up in the post office scandal, was giving evidence to the Business and Trade Committee. Now he said the culture at the post office hadn't changed and that it would be a money pit for the taxpayer for years to come. Sky's business correspondent Adele Robinson reports. My personal view about post office is it's a dead duck and it has been for years. The man still holding post office to account, Alan Bates, his crusade not yet over. It's going to be a money pit for the taxpayer for years to come and you should sell it to someone like Amazon for a pound. At a hearing into why compensation for wrongly accused sub-postmasters is delayed, calls for independent oversight. Get rid of post office out of any of these schemes. Amid multiple reasons for delays, the post office was described as incompetent and inefficient. What's emerged is a damning picture of the post office being far too slow in delivering financial redress for victims, as well as disagreements over when it can be delivered. But unfortunately, at risk of overshadowing all of that, is this ongoing he said, she said row. On one side of that, former post office chair Henry Staunton sticking to his claims the government told him to stall on compensation. It will all become clear when I speak to the select committee. And yet it didn't. I remind witnesses that they are obliged to tell the whole truth to this committee. With conflicting arguments from both Mr Staunton and the current post office chief executive Nick Reid. Nobody in my team or myself has received any instruction from the government about slowing down compensation. Do you believe the former chairman is lying? Well, I don't believe it's true. So you stand by absolutely what do. you've said in public, that compensation payments should be slowed down to minimise the financial liability? Yes, I do. And then, just before the end, another revelation, that CEO Nick Reid was in fact under investigation and had wanted to resign over pay. This was an investigation not into me, this was an investigation made into the chief executive, Nick Reid. Have you ever tried to resign as chief executive of the post office? No. Why do you say that? Outside, stunned former postmaster Chris Head, critical all this is distracting from the victims. It's just extraordinary. I mean, what, what we've heard today is, you know, blown things. It's like somebody set off a hand grenade in, into that uh, select committee this afternoon, and we have to be careful that we don't allow this to overshadow the victims in this, the, the postmasters, who might now be pushed to one side while this row drags on. But despite apparent chaos at the top of the post office, a simple message from the man who continues to spearhead this fight. There is only one priority in all of this, and that's, as I say, get the money out of the victims now. Adele Robinson, Sky News.
And if you scan the QR code on your screen right now, you can also listen to our latest Sky News daily podcast. I've been discussing the explosive claims made by the former post office CEO, Nick Staunton, or chairman, I should say. I'm joined by our business correspondent, Paul Kelso, to discuss the delays to compensation for victims of the post office scandal. Plus, the Labour MP in Lavery talks about the role Parliament's had in speeding up compensation. You can listen and subscribe to the Sky News Daily wherever you get your podcasts. Coming up next on the Politics Hub. What impact is the Islamophobia row within the Conservative Party having on the international perception of the UK? We'll hear from the civil rights campaigner, Reverend Al Sharpton, who's a damning verdict of UK race relations. That's next. Coming up on the UK tonight, an MP's investigation into the post office scandal descended into farce today, as the former boss claimed he was the victim of a smear campaign. But what did the hundreds of wrongly convicted former sub postmasters make of it all? I'll be joined by one of them. Plus, the stately home besieged by fans and influencers after its starring role in the film Saltburn. All that and much more coming up at eight. Hello, welcome back. Well, to the Islamophobia row engulfing the Conservative Party now. Yesterday on this programme, the Conservative MP Raymond Kishti told me that he raised concerns about Islamophobia in the Conservative Party with Rishi Sunak a year and a half ago and is still waiting for a meeting. Well, when this was raised at lobby this morning, that's the off-camera briefing to a huddle of political journalists, the Prime Minister's official spokesperson said the government takes a zero-tolerance approach to Islamophobia. And the Prime Minister has also described the UK as the most successful 
single multi-ethnic democracy in the world. But not everyone might agree. The uh, civil rights campaigner Reverend Al Sharpton was in the House of Lords today addressing an audience of church leaders. Well, Sky's Daniel Henry spoke to him. He joins us now live. So what, what was the message from the Reverend? Um, well, the message from the Reverend, I think, I think it's important to kind of put him in context mm. first. Reverend Al Sharpton, if there was like a, a hall of fame for civil rights activism, he would be in it. He has campaigned all his life for social justice and he is here trying to get British, black British church leaders to help people to register to vote ahead of the next general election. Mm. The aim is to get a million people to register to vote to get their voices heard. And from Al Sharpton today, what I heard was somebody who had questions about Islamophobia, questions about the language that's been used by, uh, by certain MPs. And uh, when I put it to him that Lee Anderson had made some comments in the time that he'd been here, Reverend Al Sharpton was very aware of that. And um, this is what he had to say to me when we, uh, when we caught up. Well, I think that uh, it may be, according to Prime Minister Sunak, the most successful uh, diverse nation in the world. But compared to what? Uh, I could say that uh, I am the most handsome guy in the world in, in this room if I'm standing by myself. When you have members uh, of the government that speaks in such despairingly racist terms as we have a Republican candidate, former president of the United States, the freedom they feel they can express that tells us that maybe the prime minister is putting uh, uh, sunshine glasses on. Interesting. So he's saying there that Rishi Sunak's putting his sunshine glasses on, as he puts it. Mm. I guess the PM would say, look, they have a diverse cabinet. He himself is the first non-white UK prime minister. He is, and all of that, all of that is true. Um, we've never seen more people from minority backgrounds in Parliament. Um, this, it's a record in, in, uh, in Parliament at the moment. But the point that uh, Reverend Al Sharpton was making there, um, to me, was that that's not enough. It's all very well having people who are in these places, but what are they doing with their office? What are they doing for the communities that they come from? And he also had something to say about that um, when, when, when I asked him. And you know, it, it was clear to me that he really was not impressed with how some people are using their office at the moment. I think that the, there's been the allowance of using racism and Islamophobia uh, and homophobia as a political weapon. And I think that the more it is allowed and permitted, the more it poisons the atmosphere and separates people rather than unite them. And uh, I think that it is the role of government to make sure that people are treated equally and fairly. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, really good to talk to you today, Daniel. Um, of course, the Reverend has his own uh, views uh, on the comments made by Lee Anderson, but important for us to reflect what his position is. He's admitted uh, that the language he used was clumsy, but he stood by his comments. He says that he was trying to say that London has uh, lost uh, control. Uh, so there you go. That is the position of Lee Anderson. Right, let's bring in our duo, shall we, Lord Vasey and Josh Simons. Ed, what's your take on all of this, the kind of Lee Anderson row rumbling on? Well, I think it was right that Lee Anderson lost the whip. I thought his comment was uh, outrageous, whether you want to call it Islamophobic or racist or whatever, but to the, the whole fundamental point is when you attack someone for something they are rather than for something they do, and you say that because the mayor is Muslim, he must somehow be in league with Islamic extremists or have told uh, the police to go easy on pro-Palestinian demonstrations because he's an Islamic extremist is completely outrageous and it's, it, it really demeans uh, public debate in this country. Uh, I think Rishi Sunak was right to say, you know, obviously there is racism in this country, that goes without saying, uh, but he is right to say that it, in the great spectrum of things, it is, it is a great thing that we can have a Hindu prime minister, a Muslim mayor, a black home secretary, and by and large, people rise to these positions and do these jobs without people remarking. But there's always a small minority who decide to attack them for what they are rather than for what they're doing, and it's unacceptable. Mm. What's your take, Josh? 
Well, I've got to say, this whole uh, row, you know, it, 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 it's depressing and sometimes it's sort of upsetting. Uh, my first job in politics was working for the Labour Party when Jeremy Corbyn was the leader. I'm Jewish. Um, I saw what anti-Semitism, racism on the left of, the, of British politics looks like. Uh, and it was pretty horrible, pretty unpleasant, and, you know, frankly, just not becoming of the, of the, you know, of the scale of the responsibility that you have when you're elected. And what we are witnessing in the Conservative Party now is the mirror of what we saw in the Labour Party under Jeremy Corbyn, when people who were saying things that were anti-Semitic, racist, are not being called out by the leader of that party. Well, and I Lee think Anderson has lost the whip. He's, he's and lost... Lee Anderson is not the leader of the Conservative Rishi Party. Rishi Sunak was asked six times in one interview to describe what he said as Islamophobic. And let us not forget what he said. What he said was that Islamists have control over the mayor of London. That's what he said. Now, why can the Prime Minister of the United Kingdom not describe that as Islamophobia, which is clearly... The Prime Minister of the United Kingdom took, what took the whip away from he's weak. Uh, Lee Anderson and said his comments were unacceptable. And you can call it Islamophobia, you can call it racism, but, it but you can you judge it, the Prime though, Minister on what, he, on what he said. And the key is that people like Lee Anderson, thank goodness at the moment, are not leading the Conservative Party, although I do agree there are more and more people who were once mainstream Conservatives seeming to enjoy the fact that they are hobnobbing with people with extremist views and think that that is somehow some solution and some way forward, some elixir to get to the electorate you, and turn um, the election around. Do you think he's about to join reform? Uh, I've got no insight into this, but He has said it. I mean, uh, well, he, he was Labour, he's now Tory. Uh, who knows where he will end up? Hmm. Interesting stuff. I mean, reform would, would love it. And it, going back to Sam Coates' uh, uh, voters' panel, you know, it reveals that reform is a big headache for the Conservative Party. And the fact that Rishi Sunak can't say that it was Islamophobic well, tells you that Rishi Sunak is too weak to stare down the right of his party in the face. Now, I do want to read out uh, the statement from Lee Anderson. Uh, he stood by his comments. He said, if you're wrong, apologising is not a sign of weakness, but a sign of strength. But when you think you're right, you should never apologise, because to do so would be a sign of weakness. He said his words were clumsy, but they were born out of sheer frustration at what's happening to our beautiful capital city. Thanks both very much uh, for a very uh, lively debate. Now, sacked for doing my job. That was the claim today from the former Chief Inspector of Borders and Immigration, David Neal, who was removed from his post last week. Here's what he told the Home Affairs Select Committee earlier today. I think, you know, as far as the big picture's concerned, you know, I've been sacked for uh, doing my job. Um, I think I've been sacked for um, doing what the law asks of me. Um, and, you know, I've breached, I've fallen down over um, you know, a, a clause in my employment contract, which I think is a, is a, is a crying shame. I think I've done my job extremely well. I've been candid with this committee. We've produced um, uh, multiple reports <laughs> that have um, exposed the um, sometimes lack of effectiveness and the lack of efficiency uh, in the system that um, the Borders Act sets me up to, to inspect. Well, Sky's political correspondent Tamara Cohen uh, joins us now. Tamara, you've been across this today. What's jumped out at you? So David Neal was the independent inspector of borders and immigration. He used to be commander of the military police. He's no pushover. And over the last three years in that job, he's written a series of scathing reports about the Home Office and all of the different things it does, from small boats to immigration detention. Now, last week, he got sacked for leaking sensitive information after uh, the Daily Mail reported that people coming in on private jets to a London airport were not being checked and they could, uh, it was claimed, be gangsters or people traffickers. The Home Office disputes some of those details, but he was sacked and today he was in front of MPs to tell his side of the story and he basically believes that he was sacked for telling truth to power, that he exposed things that they didn't like. He said, I was sacked for doing my job and he claims that he tried to raise some of his concerns with ministers, but he could not get a hearing with them. Now, what does his sacking mean? Well, it means that no one is doing that very important job of inspecting the borders and inspecting all these aspects of Home Office policy. And he said he expected it to take six to nine months 
for them to hire someone else. And in the next six to nine months, we've obviously got an election in which migration is going to be a crucial and controversial topic. And we've also got the government trying to get its Rwanda policy off the ground. And um, during this period, no one's going to be doing that scrutiny. He also has said before and again today that there are 15 reports he's written for the Home Office over the past year which have never seen the light of day. Now, James Cleverly uh, claimed last week when he did an interview that these would be published soon. I'm sure these will probably make quite grim reading for the Home Office. Uh, tomorrow, thank you very much indeed. Tomorrow, Cohen. Yeah. Coming up next on The Politics Hub. You ever mention that name in front of me, that filthy piece of toe rag? We're talking about the power and the perils of the Vox Pop. That's next. What we're doing right now is we are going out to some of the remotest parts of the Svalbard archipelago where polar bear mums are in their den still tucked in with their still growing cubs. And we're setting up remote camera systems. We're setting up both high definition video systems, and then simpler trail cam systems. And we're trying to get information on when polar bears come out of their dens, what they do when they're there, and what condition they're in. When polar bears are born sometime around the first of the year, they're about the size of a human fist or a stick of butter is another way to look at it. They are blind and hairless. They need that protection of the den and they need their mother's really fat, rich milk so they can grow quickly and get to the point where here pretty soon, um, within the next couple of weeks, they'll start to emerge from their dens. And that mom is gonna make her way back down to the sea ice where she can eat here in Svalbard. We've seen average winter temperatures increase as much as seven degrees C, and that is dramatic. In places I've spent most of my career, I've seen sea ice go from being close to shore where I could see it uh, within a few miles in a given year to now that same place that same ice is four to 500 miles offshore. You're talking about dramatic change, dramatic habitat loss across the Arctic. One of the most important parts of a polar bear's life is that maternal denning period. It's that critical time when these young cubs are at their most vulnerable. So we need to learn as much about what they require uh, from us in terms of a lack of disturbance, um, in terms of the habitat, that they need to be successful there. Uh, if we don't have cubs coming into the population, uh, we're not gonna have polar bears around very long. So we really need to protect the mums and cubs. Every morning here from on out, we get up pretty early, check the weather. And if it's a go, which today is a classic day of maybe, <laughs> we will load up uh, with the search and rescue helicopter team here and we will head out to a den site to deploy cameras. It's an all-day operation. Uh, when we get back, we have to get the gear set up for the next day's deployment. And I should mention, we wouldn't be here at all without our partners at Norwegian Polar Institute and our partners at San Diego Zoo who work closely with us on this project. Hello, welcome back to The Politics Hub. Well, we've got a little bit of breaking news uh, to bring you now on the speaker. Sam Coates uh, is back with us. Sam, what's happened? The speaker has lost his a second entire party uh, in terms of support. Plaid Cymru, uh, the Nationalist Wales Party, has come out against the speaker. Now, they only have three MPs. They've all signed the motion of no confidence in the speaker. That takes the number of MPs that have voted to, um, that want the speaker out of the chair to 86. But the point is, Liz Savile Roberts, the Westminster leader, has said that it's quite clear to her that Lindsay Hall isn't sticking up for smaller parties is only really helping the two big parties. It might not sound like a big deal if it's only three MPs, but the fact that small parties don't have confidence in the man that's meant to help them get their voice heard is a really big deal. Those who say this revolt is telling off, I don't think are right. Interesting. We'll have to wait and see how it develops uh, over the uh, coming days and weeks. Some there, uh, some Kate's. Well, we started the programme this evening uh, with, of course, our voters panel and some very scientific, thoroughly researched journalism from Sam. But there is another far less robust method of gauging public opinion, the much maligned Vox Pop. You know what, though? I love a Vox Pop. Don't tell anyone. They might not be scientific, but sometimes you strike gold. Brenda, over to you. Not another one? Oh, for God's sake, I can't honestly... I can't stand this. There's too much politics going on at the moment. 
Why does she need to do it? <laughs> just amazing. It's, it's just amazing. It gets better with every... You know... It's just brilliant. Perhaps one of the most... Probably the most watched thing I've ever done on television. It was nothing down to me. It was this. Have a listen. We're just here in Uxbridge today, um, Boris Johnson's constituency. Did you ever mention that name in front of me, that filthy piece of toe rag? <laughs> it just came from... It came from nowhere. Oh. I mean, what do you think? Is there a place the Vox Pop? Or are I you a purist? The, as you said about... No, I'm certainly not a purist. I, uh, as you said about focus groups as opposed to polling, you can't answer the why question with numbers. And even in focus groups, the sort of distillation of emotion and feeling that really is, you know, most people don't pay attention to politics all the time. They have a quick gut reaction, and that's what shapes what they do in the ballot box. That's what I think a Vox Pop, at its best, can capture. Do you get that kind of thing door knocking then? Uh, well, you get it all the time, yeah. I mean, my, fav my, my Vox Pop when I was a candidate in Bristol East in 97, because it was interesting hearing Josh earlier talk about, you know, Blair hadn't sealed the deal. He'd certainly sealed it in the Middle <laughs> East. I can tell you that. And I remember driving behind, in my battle bus, behind a middle-class mother, sorry to be cliché, driving a Volvo with a sunroof, and uh, she put her hand out the sunroof. I was expecting a wave, and I got a Vox two fingers. A <laughs> Vox two fingers. <laughs> I love it. So uh, that, for me, was when I knew the sun was shining. I knew it was curtains. Yeah, yeah. Honestly, that, that clip, the filthy piece of tail rag, it was just... It just... Yeah, it's just brilliant. I mean, of all the people to bump into Oxford, Boris Johnson's aren't. I mean, unbelievable. Oh, but um, <laughs> I agree with Josh as well. I mean, you know, the focus group that Sam did at the beginning, uh, the lady who said, you know, mm. Keir Prime Minister is, a, is not a Prime Minister in waiting, he's a Prime Minister who is waiting, as mm. it were, uh, was a good vox pop in itself. You're going to nick that one, then? I am. I'm yeah. going to use it a lot on your programme. There you go. I look forward to that uh, <laughs> I'll happening. I'll never be invited back now. <laughs> uh, and what do you... So, uh, I mean... When it comes to focus groups and vox pops, then, do you think the politicians kind of nick the best lines and use them again? Definitely. All, as Sam said, all good campaign slogans in the last three or four years mm. have all come from voters. I mean, the slightly depressing thing about vox pops at the moment, and focus groups, actually, is that just the level of disillusionment and resentment mm. and anger, you know? Mm. No one is energised or, you know, motivated by politics at all. And, and fair actually, enough, you know, frankly. Yeah. There's, I mean, there's what, something what wrong with that. to be energised about? Mm. Do you think Brenda wants an election now, then? I think Brenda would... I don't know what Brenda wants, but she doesn't want this. No. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks both uh, very much indeed, uh, Ed and Josh. Great to have you on the programme this evening. Well, that is it from us this evening, but I will see you right here tomorrow night at 7pm. Up next, it's the UK Tonight. That, of course, is with Sarah Jane Me. See you tomorrow, and great to have you here this evening. <laughs>